Exodus chapter number 18. Matter of fact, the next several uh, Sundays, we're going to be looking in the book of Exodus. We're going to be exploring uh, the book of Exodus and seeing uh, some scenes there in the book of Exodus. I don't know that I've ever, in my 18 years here, spent uh, as much time as we'll spend in the next several weeks on Sunday mornings from the book of Exodus, but I was just planning my preaching at the end of last year and uh, just just saw some things in Exodus. God just kind of led me in that direction that I believe will be, a, be a, a great word for our church where we are right now. Now, re you remember we began this morning uh, a message entitled Jethro's Counsel for the New Testament Church. And uh, it, chapter 18, you understand the, the context. Already Moses is the leader of the Israelite people. He's led them uh, out of uh, bondage. They're wandering around uh, between a million and two million people, most Bible scholars believe. And uh, Moses is trying to, to do everything he can for these people. He's trying to meet all of their needs and, and just trying to be a good leader. And uh, his father-in-law comes along. Uh, Moses has dropped his father-in-law or his, his wife off and uh, their kids off and uh, with his father-in-law to, to go and, and assume the, the task and the leadership and the things that he needed to do with the people or that he thought he needed to do with the people. And it wasn't, uh, it must have been uh, uh, quite some time because old Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, he just decides to pick up uh, uh, his uh, daughter whom he'd already raised. He didn't need to keep raising her. And uh, he just takes them to Moses and said, Hey man, uh, you remember who these guys are? This is your family. And uh, then he watches Moses deal with the people. And he, he looks and he, he sees uh, from sunup to sundown, Moses is trying to deal with each person individually. I mean, he, he's trying. And, and while he's dealing with each person and trying to give them his time and trying to do the, give them the best counsel that he can give them, there are still hundreds of thousands in line waiting to see him. And he's trying to do it one at a time, one at a time. And some of those things only Moses can take care of. But there are some of those things that the people are bringing to him that while Moses would want to take care of them, he doesn't necessarily have to. And quite frankly, there's somebody else that could probably do a better job than he could do. And so Jethro pulls Moses to the side and he says, Son-in-law, listen, what you're doing to the people is, is not a good thing. Now you and I would look at it and Moses would look at it and he'd say, what do you mean what I'm doing to the people? I'm not doing anything to them. I'm doing something for them. And, but Jethro says, no, you're not. You're wearing yourself out and you're, you're giving your people the short end of the stick because making yourself or, or, or putting yourself out there for everybody, you're no good to anybody at the end of the day. And so what you're doing is not a good thing. He, here's what you need to do, Moses. And uh, the first thing that Jethro told him basically was, hey, you have got to realize your limits. You've got to realize your limits personally. I mean, there's only so many hours in a day. You, you've still got a family to tend to. You, you've been neglecting your time with God. So you've got to realize your limits personally. But he, he said, Moses, you've got to realize your limits physically. You can't keep going like this. You know what happens when you burn a candle at both ends? Sooner or later they come together and the candle dies. You, you can't keep doing this physically. You've got to take care of yourself physically. And then he, he says, you, you've got to uh, realize your limits emotionally. I mean, every, every time you give, you're giving a piece of yourself. And, and sooner or later, if you don't take care of yourself emotionally, you're going to be emotionally burned out. You're going to be dried up. You're not going to be able to feel anything. So listen, Moses, you've got to have some help. You've got to have some people to come alongside of you and help. But you, you've got to realize these things in your life. And so basically that's where we stop this morning. So let's move on into point number two. Not only must leadership realize its limits, but second of all, leadership must delegate the loads. We've got to share the loads. Now, remember, remember, we just said it. There's only so much time that we have. We've we got to realize our limits personally and physically and emotionally. Therefore, some of the load, the work, the responsibilities in ministry, they must be delegated. 
They, they've got to be shared. And so here, here's Jethro's advice or his counsel to Moses. Pick up reading in verse number 18. Verse number 18, he says, Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice. I'll give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be there, be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shall show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. So that, that's uh, Jethro's advice to his son-in-law, Moses. And I believe that it was God-led advice. So why share the load? In ministry. Why share the load in the work? Well, first of all, it's because the work is enormous. The work is enormous. The, the task that Moses faced here now, it was behemoth. It was a monster task leading to possibly two million people. At that, two million Old Testament Baptists. I mean, he, he's trying to lead them in a big program, trying to do it efficiently. He's trying to do it responsibly. Two million people. He couldn't do that by himself. His father-in-law says, what in the world are you doing to them and what in the world are you doing to yourself? You're going to wear yourself out and you're going to wear the people out if you don't have some help. Hey, hey I love our staff here at Blue Ridge U. They do a tremendous job. You've seen Diana has has stepped up It's going to help us in our music ministry. Great staff, works hard, bought into what we're doing here, and, and they do a great job, and I appreciate them. They work so hard, and I believe most pastors are, are so appreciative, but I was reading something this week that really hit home to me, and I want you to think about this, and, and I want you to think, you may be visiting tonight, you may go to another church, and, and your church isn't uh, having service tonight. I want you to think uh, about uh, what your pastor uh, has to do on a regular basis. He plans his preaching. He prepares his messages Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. He preaches uh, those messages. He visits the hospital. He tries to make the surgeries that are being done. He does weddings. He does funerals. He goes to wedding rehearsals. He stays by the bedside of those who are dying. He counsels those getting married. He counsels those that are married. He counsels adults. He counsels youth. He cancels even children. He's on call 24 hours a day. He tries to comfort the grieving. He tries to plan events and programs. He tries to win the lost. He's a fundraiser. He tries to raise money weekly in order to meet the budget. He oversees the budget. He goes to deacons meetings, committee meetings, staff meetings. He meets with architects and bankers. He needs to be involved in denominational work at some level. He has a staff to administrate. No wonder ministers sometimes run around like a chicken with its head cut off. Amen? I mean, you've seen them. You've seen them. There's a reason that 1,200 ministers quit the ministry every month. Some of those are burned out. They go under. They, they come apart. Some, some preachers remind me of a sailor who was unloading a ship down in New Orleans, and as he was walking off the ship, the gangplank broke. He fell into the Mississippi, and he, he was going under, and he went down once, and he came up, and he yelled for help. He went down again, and he came up, and he yelled for help, and he, he went down the third time, and the third time he came up, he said, if somebody doesn't help me, I'm going to have to drop one of these suitcases that I'm holding. <laughs> now, now, maybe, hey, that, that's a pretty good lesson in that, amen. Now, maybe, maybe you're thinking, well, maybe we just need to slow down a little bit, preacher. Maybe we need to quit growing. Maybe we need to quit reaching, quit ministering. Maybe we just need to, to uh, quit being blessed of God. Absolutely not. You know what we need to do? We need to have more people serving. I mean, any time we stop growing, we start dying. We'll either grow and glow or we will dry and die. We will evangelize or we will fossilize, but we will not stand still. You see, just as in any organism, we either move on or we pass on. Amen? So the, the load must be delegated, the, the work must be delegated because the task is enormous. But second of all, or the work is enormous, second of all, is because the work is everybody's. It's everybody's. 
Now, look, look again in verse number 19. Let's keep reading. Or go down to verse 21. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Now listen, there is the work, but it's not just one man's work. It's everybody's load to share. Now here's what I hear sometimes, and maybe you've heard this, but here's what I hear as a pastor sometimes. I, I hear, well, you know, you just can't break into the inner circle in that church. I mean, there's a, a, a little clique here, a little group of people who run everything. They do everything. I'm on the outside. They're on the inside, and they, they kind of make all the decisions. Hear me tonight. You want to get on the inside? And sign up and go to work. Amen. Uh, listen, uh, Jethro says, Thou shalt provide out of all the people able men. Could I ask you tonight, are you able? Are you an able person? Such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. That means you, you, you hate covetousness. You don't give it to, keep it to yourself. You give it away. You're a giver. Amen? Amen? Now you show me somebody that's walking with God uh, that's able, able people that want to serve God and they will be in the inner circle quicker than you can say onomatopoeia. Amen? <laughs> you want to get in the clique, you want to get in the inner circle, just sign up and serve. You will always feel like an outsider in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ if you don't do anything in the body. You will always feel like an outsider. There's no little clique of people around here that wouldn't be glad for you to be right in the middle of it. Amen? And now our God knows that we need to share in the work. And here's what Jethro said. Thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating, covetous. Now notice what he says. He says here that we're to place them over the people. Many of you have heard this. This might be the first time. Our young people ever heard this, but most of you have heard the statement, many hands make light work. Many hands make light work. That's a faithful saying. Listen, if, if me and Stacy, we got together, we went over here and we wanted to lift that piano, I'm going to tell you, we wouldn't get very far. But if, if, if me and Stacy and Brian and Jonathan and, and uh, Ronnie and Landon over there and Harrison and, and uh, several other, uh, Don and Tommy, if we all got around that piano... It should go, if we should lift it, it should go off without a hitch. Amen? Why? Because two hands or ten hands are better than two hands. It's amazing what we can accomplish to get there's beauty when people join together and work together. We would make a hard task for one or two an easy task for ten. You ever wondered why? Uh, I, 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 I love to do this at the beach. I, I love to sit on the beach and, and watch the seagulls fly. You know, they're interesting creatures. Hey, did you know that you can put food on the top of your head and they'll come down and get it right off? I know that. They're interesting creatures. I told you, I'm... I'm you don't believe that, that Sadie's got some pictures somewhere, really. But listen, you ever wonder why those geese or those gulls, they fly in a formation, that V formation? The naturalists tried to understand and figure out why the geese, as they go south or go north, always fly in a V formation. You see them going overhead in that, that formation, and one lead goose gets out there, a seagull gets out there, and he flaps for a while, and he leads. And then after a while, he wears out, and he falls back to the end of the line. You know what I'm talking about. You see this if, if you're a hunter or if you love to go to the beach, you know what I'm talking about. And then another one comes up, and that's the way they fly. And then they found out, the men, the specialists in aerodynamics, they finally understood it. Two engineers calibrated in a wind tunnel what happens in a V formation. And they found out that each goose, when he flaps his wings, he creates an inward and an upward lift for the goose that follows. And so all these geese, when they do their part, they increase their range by 71% over what they could achieve 
if one goose were flying all by himself. How amazing is that? That's just not, not a neat story. That's just not a neat illustration. Listen, there is a lesson and a principle in that illustration. God knows that the same thing would be true in His church. Remember what, what uh, the psalmist said in Psalm 133 and verse 1? Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. Now here's the thing. Here's the thing. And I want you to listen to me. Here's what you need. There were some things that only Moses could do. Some things only he could do. He, he had a unique calling. And there were some things that only he would be able to do. Now, now there are some things that church members think only the pastor can do or should do. But listen, quite frankly, somebody else could do it. And probably do it better. Amen? Now, hey, perfect example of that is Wednesday night when I'm up here trying to lead music. I'll be honest with you, I can't lead music. I want to so bad, though. <laughs> these singers, these singers. I told Kristen Porter down here, she was laughing at me singing. Yeah, I know she's going to say she wasn't laughing, but she was laughing at me singing right there. And I said, you singers, y'all think y'all the only ones that can sing. <laughs> Just wait till I get to heaven. <laughs> but there were some things that only Moses could do. Some things that he was, but there were some things that he was taking on that could have been taken care of by somebody else. I mean, Jethro just watching what was going on, he could tell that. You know, one of those Israelites surrounding Moses, they should have gone to Moses and said, Moses, I don't want you to do anything that we can do so that you can do everything that we can't do. Moses was doing some things, but not the things at that time that God necessarily wanted him and needed him to be doing. So, so here's how Jethro, go back to it in verses 19 and 20. Here's how Jethro instructed Moses to do. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to God word, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. So in our modern day vernacular, our paraphrase, Jethro says, Moses, you get in that study, you get on your face before God, and you pray to God, and you intercede for these dear people that you're leading, and then you get a message burning in your heart, and you stand before those people, and you tell them what God has said. You tell them God's laws. You tell them God's statutes. You tell them of God's ordinances. And uh, what they need is a word from Almighty God. What they need is a man of God coming from his study with bursting lips and a bur burning heart to preach the word of God. Now, I was thinking about that this week as I studied. I said, you know what? I don't think there's one immoral thing in America that could not be changed if we had a generation of preachers who would stand up in their pulpit and simply preach, thus saith the Lord. Amen? I mean, preach it straight. Pray, preach it strong, preach it with conviction, preach it with con uh, compassion, but preach it as God has said it. Amen. But I just believe we need some sermons that have been freshly baked in the oven of heaven so that the people of God could feed on it and feast off of it because it came straight from the Word of God. Amen? Amen. So there, there were some things Moses, he, he couldn't delegate. Some things that only he could do. Things that God wanted him specifically to do. Jethro knew that Moses had that responsibility. So some of what Jethro has said to Moses, I hope this rung a bell to you a little bit. Some of what Jethro has said to Moses sure sounds a lot like what the first century church did in the book of Acts. When the church got a little haywire due to the growth, the, the widows started bickering against each other. I, my needs aren't being, met, be, being made met. My needs aren't being made met. And so the apostles get together and gets the early church together and says, here's what you need to do. You need to find you seven men of honest report, able men, full of the Holy Ghost, to handle some of these issues with the widows and some of the work of the ministry so that you can attend to prayer and preaching, Bible study and preaching. And you know what the Word of God says? 
The Bible says when that happened that the word of God increased greatly. Now I wonder where they got that idea. You know, I just think maybe they looked back there at old Jethro and his counsel to Moses. Hey, old Jethro was on to something back there. That first century church in the book of Acts grew like wildfire. When those men got on their faces before God and then stood to preach the word of God, and so Jethro says, Moses, you get you some godly laymen, get you some men, get you some women, some people, and you put them to work so that you can do those things that only you can do. Verse 21, moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Let's bring that right down to Blue Ridge View Baptist Church. We've got the preacher up there. He's trying to oversee. He's trying to meet everybody's need, but he realizes that he can't. There are 900 people here at Blue Ridge View Baptist Church on our church rolls. There's no way I can see everybody every week or, or every month, but he's trying to administrate everything. So what does he do? He calls a staff around. He says, staff, we, we've got these 900 to 1,000 members. You know what? I need somebody to be over at preschool. I need somebody to take on the children. I need somebody to work with our youth. I need somebody to work with our adults. I need somebody uh, to make sure we're taking care of our, our senior adults. The rulers over thousands. Every area of ministry. And then we've, we've got our, our deacons. Really the same principle, just in a different way. The, the deacons... Uh, Come alongside and, and you've got those 900 members. You kind of break the, the thousands now. You kind of break them into hundreds. Each of our deacons, they have 100, 120 or so names that they're given when they come on the deacon committee, the deacon team. And we, we call it the deacon family ministry plan. And, and our deacons try to, uh, they get their the rosters broke down. And so they're the, they're the leaders over the hundreds. They try to make sure everything's running smoothly in somebody's life. Many times I'll try, if I remember, I'll call Ann. I'll say, Ann, uh, Miss Mildred is in the hospital. And uh, could you get uh, Brother Brian to contact Randall or Glenn and, and check on Miss Mildred? Maybe if he's got time to run by there. And so, listen, listen to me. I want you to remember now. You say, well, I have no idea who my deacon is. Listen to me. Listen to me. That's my fault. I'm going to do a better job of delegating these deacons and, and all of us getting on the same page. Don't you blame that deacon. That, that comes from the top right there. Now, I'm going to do a better job of that, but I, want, I also want you to remember that they work 40 and 50 hours a week as well, and they've got a family at home too. So we're trying to break it down where we minister better, and then after those deacons over those hundreds, you got Sunday school teachers down to the 50s. You break the hundreds down into the 50s. you got Sunday school classes. And you know who pastors those Sunday school classes? That's right, Sunday school teachers. And a lot of our Sunday school classes, I, I hope most of them are broke down like this, especially the adults. Miss Verna's got a perfect model in her class. She's got her class broken down into care groups. Care group, she's got uh, five names here, five names here, five names here, five names here. And over those five names, she's got this person that calls that five weekly, this person that calls that five weekly, this person that calls that five weekly or, or bi-weekly or monthly. Just to check on them, maybe they hadn't been here. Friend, that, that's a that's pretty, good, pretty good idea, amen? And then you got the tens. You know what the tens are? They're just ministry teams. Ministry teams that we have that take care of, you know, some of the things that you see go on here. But you kind of get the picture. That's kind of how Jethro was telling Moses. You see, there, there are some limits we need to realize. And there are some loads that we need to delegate. And I believe that our church can continue to grow and continue to be blessed as each one of us say, Dear God, what is it you would have me to do? What is it that you want me to do? Where is my place in this body called Blue Ridge View Baptist Church? We're all in the family. And listen to me. There's plenty of work to do in the family. If you would just say, if you just ask, Lord, show me where my place is. Hey, we don't need on the one hand to say, Pastor, you do it all or we're not going to grow. Or on the other hand, say, Pastor, you can't do it all, so we'll just quit. We need to say together, hey, we'll work together and we'll never stop growing until Jesus comes. You know what the idea here is? The idea here is that more needs get met. 
The idea here is that more ministry is being done. The idea is more people are being reached for Jesus Christ. So leadership must realize its limits, must delegate its load, but third of all, leadership must envision the lives being saved. You find it in verses 23 through, 30, or 23 through 27. Tim's going to put that up on the screen. 23 through 27. Here's what Jethro said to Moses. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so. Now, now Jethro, as I said, he's, he's great counsel. He basically says, this is what I think, but you, you better check with God. <laughs> Amen? Amen? If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all this people shall also go to their place in peace. Leadership must envision the lives being saved. First of all, uh, the ministry of the leader, his, his, the, that ministry is going to be saved. Moses' ministry would be saved. Moses would endure. Listen to me. I'm one of those guys that I would rather last out than burn out. Amen? Some guys used to say, boy, I'd rather uh, rust out than, than burn out. Well, listen, you don't have to do either one. Man, I want to last out. Amen? And then the masses being led are going to be saved. Moses' ministry is going to be saved, but the lives of many others would be saved. Notice that Jethro said to Moses, Moses, if you don't do something... You will wear away, but thou and this people that is with me. Moses, I'm not just trying to take care of you. I'm not just trying to save you for the people. I'm also trying to save those people for themselves. Amen? Now, I close as I did this morning. If everybody gets involved, the work is going to be done. And I don't believe that many folks will be overlooked. And I believe everybody has something to do. Getting the uncommitted, the uninvolved, and the uncaring. Getting them involved. Getting them committed. And getting them caring. Remember what I told you this morning? Three things that a man needs in order to be happy. Somebody to love. Something to believe in. And a cause to serve. There's your satisfaction. That, that's your contentment. That's your joy. And Jesus Christ is every one of those and more. Lord, show me where you want me. Lord, show me where to serve. Hey, listen, call one of these ministry leaders and, and, and just tell I'm making myself available. If you don't think I'm qualified, qualify me. If I need to be trained, train me. But if there's something I can do, put me to work. Friend, when there's the family love to share, there is the family load to bear. Lou Ridge View, as I told you this morning, we need to be in it together this year at Blue Ridge View Baptist Church. Amen? I don't know of a church that is in greater harmony and unity and love. I, I don't know of a church that wants to move and progress any more than Blue Ridge View Baptist Church does. And I don't know of another church that supports and encourages and works alongside of their pastor and leadership better than Blue Ridge View Baptist Church does. Hey, let's keep it going. Let's make sure that none fall in the cracks. And some things that I'm going to share with you fall through the cracks. Well, some things I'm going to share with you in the days to come are going to give some of you that opportunity to become involved and to become caring and committed. And so I want you to, to leave your hearts open to receive some of those things that I'm going to share in the next couple of weeks on Sunday night.